Hey, this is John Flansburg of They Might Be Giants, and you're listening to The Skeptic Zone. Welcome to The Skeptic Zone, the podcast from Australia for science and reason. Welcome to the Skeptic Zone from a stormy Sydney, Australia. This is episode number 367 on the 1st of November, 2015. As I look outside the window here, grey skies, scattered cloud, mixture of dark and light grey, bolts of lightning, thunder near and far. I better watch out. I thought I'd give you a little bit... Oh, there's some now. I thought I'd give you a little bit of... Local atmosphere coming up on this week's show. As you heard right at the top of the show, a nice little introduction there by John Flansberg from They Might Be Giants. Maynard catches up with him um, to talk about the album about science and uh, some tour dates for They Might Be Giants. Oh, wow, that was a big ball of lightning about two kilometres away. I'm guessing maybe one kilometre away. Those of you who are good at counting can, can figure that out. After that, we have a talk from Skeptic Camp, which was just before the Australian National Convention a few weeks ago in Brisbane, where Maureen Chuck will talk about the court case and the outcome, uh, the heavy penalty awarded against Homeopathy Plus and Fran Sheffield. Homeopathy Plus, you might remember the outfit, the zany, wacky outfit that was publicising on their website the... Uh, the news, the information that you can use their magic sugar water to protect against things like pertussis. Oh dear. Do they get their comeuppance? Oh yes they do. Find out soon with uh, the talk given by Maureen Chuck. That was another big bolt of lightning I just saw. Wow. <clears throat> then to round off the show, it's Maynard's spooky action at the National Convention, part two of his interview with Joe Nickel, the legendary sceptical investigator. This week, Joe will be talking about thunder. No, he won't. There's a lot of thunder. This week, Joe will be talking about the Shroud of Turin, how to investigate mysteries, and UFO abductions. Now, this man is the man who knows all about these subjects. What a fascinating man he is. And thank you again to Maynard for... Such a wonderful interview. Part two of the interview with Joe Nickel coming up at the end of the show. But now it's time for me to run quickly downstairs away from this thunder and lightning, uh, open up my mother's old recipe book and make up a batch of peanut butter cookies. Um, stay tuned to the end of this episode after the music for an Easter egg and uh, about peanut butter cookies. I like them so much. I've liked them since the late 60s. You might enjoy them too. Well, I do all that. I hope you enjoy The Skeptic Zone. Here's Maynard's spooky action at a distance. Is a metal, you see it every day. Oxygen eventually will make it rust away. Carbon in its ordinary form is coal. Crush it together and diamonds are born. Come on, come on and meet the elements. May I Look, of course, they might be giants. The two Johns Flansburg who we're speaking to and Mr. Linnell, they will be touring across Australia in November. Go see them. They formed in 82, according to uh, Wikipedia. My favourite album of theirs is Apollo 18. My favourite track on that album is Fingertips. Their last album was Nanobots. My favourite song on that was Tesla. There, that's, that's about me. Uh-huh. uh-huh. Well, we've had a, a new album out since then called Glean, and I think, I think all your new favourite songs are on that. Oh, OK. Well, I, I, will, I will update my software in my brain on that immediately after the interview. Yeah, yeah. Although, 
strange, strangely enough, we actually have two more albums coming out in the next uh, four months. Well, yes, you've got you've got a, a, a greatest hits double CD coming out fairly shortly in Australia. Fifty million, they might be giant songs. Can't be wrong on an Elvis tip there. Yeah, yeah, that John Linnell uh, cooked up that title. I I love the title. I think it's uh, it's very it's very appropriate, especially considering the it's a double CD with like a you know it seems like it's got like thirty songs a disc on it. So it's it's really. Uh, it's oversized. So, so how did you choose the ones to go on there? Did the two of you have an arm wrestle? How did you work it out? Uh, we did it the old-fashioned way. We let, we let the record company uh, figure <laughs> it out. We, um, the, one, the first disc is actually from a compilation that we, that we did with Rhino in the United States a few years back, um, which I think, I, I think was called The User's Guide. So that was kind of like a greatest hits of like the first 15 or 20 years of our career. And then the second disc was combi- compiled by the Australian uh, record company who were very, uh, very thoughtful about how to do it and, uh, and did a good job. But I don't think there was any... I can't remember. There were some, there were some small revisions, but nothing, nothing too, too picky. Now, I want, well, I want to point to the Science album because I, I do love the, the Science album, the Here, Here Comes Science. That was a great album. Oh, thank you. And, and, uh, and great for kids too. And, look, if we were to play a, a song off that, uh, we've, we've gone through the one about the sun, the controversial sun issue, which we all know about. But is there one on that that you think, <laughs> pe- you think people could, well, you know, it was controversial at the time. Uh, is there one you think people could learn something from off that album that they don't think about normally? Well, I mean... The song "Meet the Elements" is actually a pretty good uh, little sort of, you know, primary course in uh, how elements, what the elements are, and and what it's all about. Oh, can I ask you, Mr. Flansburg, what is your favorite element? Oh, I'm I'm personally very fond of oxygen. Whenever I can get it, <laughs> that's true. It does tend to be popular. I'm, I'm a bit of a fan of americonium just because it's so rare and unusual. Oh, that sounds like a good one. Is that is that a, one of the expansion team? Yeah, it, it, one of the expansion ones. It's very rare. It's in most phones and electronics in a small amount, and there's only a few places in the world you can mine it. I think Vietnam, they've got a little bit in China. We have some in Australia, of course. Was it added to the periodic table, like, later on? Yeah. Yes, it was, yeah. Right, right, right. Because there are, like, there's, like, a half dozen or so, right, that are all new. And they all have names like that. They're all like unobtainium-y. <laughs> yes, which, which is the great name. And it must have been great going through and doing the track. Oh, I mean, the Science album was a really big challenge because it was like, are you familiar with the uh, concept of the Peter Principle, which is like the idea of being promoted to your level of incompetence? Oh, yes, yeah, so that, that's where but people naturally rise to the level where they keep trying to do things until eventually they get to the level where they fail. Yeah, I, I feel like having... You know, the people at Disney were very confident that we could do this science album. Well, it's also very unusual to have your lyrics peer-reviewed. Yeah, exactly. And, uh, you know, I think I, if we knew, you know, we know a lot about music, but uh, we weren't doing a Here Comes Music album. We were doing a science album. So, so we really needed some, uh, we needed some outside confirmation that we weren't just completely full of it. Well, but thank you, John Flansberg. Look forward to seeing you in Australia. Uh, go see them, people. You've got to have a lot of fun. Think about whether you want to be people or apes before you go. It could be a bit confrontational at the time. For a band that, that's so, you know, you, you're actually divisive as a band when you do that with an audience, and I love it. Oh, thank you so much. It's been a pleasure. It's been a pleasure. Thank you. Enjoy the rest of your day, and I hope your interviews are great. Thank you. See you in Australia. John Flansberg of They Might Be Giants. Cheers. Hello, Maynard here with some of the They Might Be Giants tour dates. Isn't John Flansburg a lovely man? Okay, for Australian listeners, uh, on the 2nd of November, they'll be in Perth, Western Australia. On the 4th of November, Hindmarsh, South Australia. Get to that one. Uh, That's the governor. Uh, Fortitude Valley, of course, where else? The Tivoli in uh, Queensland on the 5th of November. On the 6th of November... That's the one I'll be at, Sydney, New South Wales. I'll be wandering around with my microphone at the Enmore Theatre. Come and say hello. And then in Melbourne on the 7th of November at the Forum Theatre. And then, of course, uh, they'll be in Portland. Um, ME. I think that's Maine. Portland, me? 
anyway, uh, at the Port, Portland City Music Hall. That'll be on the uh, 19th of November. And then, of course, for those people in Leeds, they might be Giants play Leeds on the 27th of January at the Brudenal Social Club. The, a fight will probably break out there later. And, of course, Glasgow, where a fight has probably broken out, even as we're speaking, on the 31st of January. Uh, they're playing there and... Um, Hang on a minute, St. Petersburg, Florida. Oh, it's Florida. Okay, that's on the 5th of April next year. Uh, and uh, all the latest date we've got on the 10th of April next year in Philadelphia, PA, Theatre of the Living Arts. That's where they might be giants are playing. But go see them in Australia. Go there. Go, go the Aussies. Go Australia. I'm eating Vegemite as we speak. Can I say that? Is Richard going to cut that out? Ah, oh, bugger him. How much truth is there to claims of risk caused by the treatment of beef cattle with antibiotics? I'm Tamara Robertson, and you're hooked up to The Feeding Tube. The Feeding Tube is the web video series that brings you the real facts behind popular food myths. Food Woo is the most pervasive pop pseudoscience out there right now, and it desperately needs debunking. Each three-minute episode is suitable for general audience and is produced by scientists for everyone. The Feeding Tube. Check it out. Feedingtube.tv Welcome to a week in science from RO Oz, bringing you the science you need to know. Flowers, they make a great Mother's Day gift, Valentine's Day gift, or just any day of the year. But why do we love giving them as much as we love getting them? Let's find out. Flowers are the reproductive part of a plant, producing seeds or pollen. Many plants have evolved colourful blooms, strong scents, and produce nectar to attract pollinating animals as part of their reproductive cycle. But for humans, the pleasant aroma of flowers is more than just a sweet-smelling perfume. Hidden inside that smell are a class of chemicals known as prolyl endopeptidase inhibitors, or PEIs. When you sniff flowers, these PEIs are absorbed into your body and increase production of hormones associated with love, arousal and memory. And it just so happens that the most potent PEIs are found in roses, the preferred flower of Valentine's Day. But research has shown, in addition to a chemical boost, there are other good reasons for giving flowers as gifts. Humans have evolved to associate positive emotional responses at the sight of flowers. This response can significantly lift the mood of the recipient because of the strong connection between smell and memory. And in related research, scientists are exploring evidence that the chemicals found in a floral scent may also inhibit enzymes which cause Alzheimer's disease. But if you need any further encouragement, studies also show that those who give flowers are perceived as more successful, caring and emotionally intelligent when compared to giving other similar gifts. And now, four fast facts about keeping your cut flowers fresh. When placing flowers in a vase, always recut the stems with a slant while immersed in water. This will stop air entering the stem and prevent wilting. Adding the correct concentration of sugar, bleach or vodka to the water keeps flowers fresh by preventing microbial growth. Place your flowers in a cool, airy spot and keep them away from the fruit bowl. Gases produced by fruit will shorten a flower's life. And finally, never give the carry-on flower as a gift. Apart from standing over three metres in height, its aroma is the stomach-churning stench of rotting flesh. That's it for this week in science. For more on the science of giving flowers, go to the RL's website, riaus.org.au. Follow us on Twitter at RIOz and like us on Facebook. I'm Ben Lewis and we'll catch you next week. Want to help support the Skeptic Zone and look pretty damn stylish while you're about it? Visit Mr. Cat's Origami Jewelry. Go to www.skepticzone.tv and click the link, or simply Google Mr. Cat's Origami Jewelry, also on Facebook. Pendants, earrings, and cufflinks. Support Mr. Cat. Support the Skeptic Zone.
Okay, so uh, welcome Maureen to the stage, please. Just, uh... Stage. Hi, everyone. Um, so I had a bit of a gift this week. Um, I've given this talk uh, twice before, but now I finally have a conclusion. So on Tuesday, um, Justice Perry from the Federal Court handed down a $115,000 penalty to Homeopathy Plus. And, and um, 23000 to Franz Sheffield. Now, this all started way back in 2009 with Ken Harvey, Professor Ken Harvey. Gotta love him. He made a complaint to the TGA um, about Franz Sheffield writing an article that said the pertussis vaccine was short-lived and ineffective. Um, Now, the TGA asked Fran to publish a retraction on her website um, because it breached their therapeutic goods advertising code. So the retraction was supposed to be that an an advertisement for homeopathic protection homeoprophylaxis or homeoprophylactic products, which we published on this website, should not have been published. In the advertisement, we unlawfully made claims that the homeoprophylaxis products could prevent some serious infectious diseases, including meningococcal disease. A complaint about the advertisement was recently upheld by the Complaints Resolution Panel and the evidence we provided was wholly inadequate to support the claims we made. The panel therefore found that the claims were unlawful, misleading and unverified and breached the Therapeutic Goods Advertising Code. The Therapeutic Goods Administration therefore ordered that we publish this retraction, except she didn't. She refused to post the retraction. She said she wasn't advertising but she was providing information. And unfortunately the TGA is a bit of a toothless tiger and it didn't go any further. So Ken wouldn't give up, so he took it to the ACCC because not only was at the same time as she was saying the pertussis vaccine wasn't working, she was also selling a product that she claimed was effective. So in April 2012, the ACCC investigated the Homeopathy Plus website Fran was ordered to remove the article about pertussis vaccination, claiming it was short-lived and unreliable and no longer effective. So she, she couldn't see the problem with it, but she complied and said she would have a think about it. And then she posted a revised article in November of that year, but it still contained all the offending claims. So um, she changed it, but she hadn't changed the, the part that... The, that they wanted her to change. So then in February, the ACCC advised her that the content was potentially deceptive and misleading. Am I in anyone's way? I'm so short you can see over me anyway. <laughs> um, and they advised her that the matter could be resolved by consent if Homeopathy Plus agreed to particular orders by ACCC. Now, I don't know exactly what those orders were, but I I believe it was probably a retraction, an injunction to remove the articles, um, some sort of penalty and cost to the ACCC. Well, of course, she refused to do that. So two days later, they served her with a summons to go to court. So... We got to the court day. Okay, okay, so we had a four-day hearing in between the 18th to 21st of November 2013. And I actually was going to hide these slides, but uh, these were the two uh, counsel, Miss Ruth Higgins for the ACCC and Marcel White for um, Homeopathy Plus. He also unsuccessfully represented... um, uh, Meryl Dory in her unsuccess- unsuccessful appeal to uh, the name change. Um, he's got quite a pedigree, but I'm not going to go into it here, but if anyone wants to know about it, I'm happy to talk later. Yeah. 
So the expert witnesses for the ACCC in the court case were Dr Nigel William Crawford, who's the medical head of immunisation services at the Royal Children's Hospital in Melbourne, Professor Karen Phelps, who's a GP. She, she, she's firmly on the side of vaccination and um, I think she was probably called because she is also a former head of the AMA. And Dr Nicholas Woods, who's a paediatrician at Westmead Children's Hospital and also works at the National Centre for Immunisation Research and Surveillance. So they all gave their evidence and apart from some clarifying questions um, about their submissions, their evidence went largely unchallenged. Now, the expert witnesses for Homeopathy Plus were the aforementioned Dr Isaac Golden, who has a PhD in Homeopathy, (laughs) Dr Mark Donohoe, who is a GP and a well-known anti-vaccination, Dr Jürgen Schult, who's a lecturer at the School of Mathematical and Physical Sciences at UTS, and Fran Sheffield herself. Now, before they actually gave evidence, Isaac Gole and the ACCC went through their submissions and um, Isaac Golden had much of his um, submission excluded as evidence because most of the references were to his own publications <laughs> and also on the basis of generality, ambiguity and that it lacked foundation. And Mr White, Marcel White for... Uh, Fran complained that Dr Golden's affidavit was subject to a far greater level of scrutiny than any of the ACCC's expert witnesses. And judge, and they actually adjourned and Judge Perry ruled on that and she said that Dr Golden's affidavit doesn't contain evidence of effectiveness or homeopathy, of, of homeopathy, therefore his admissibility as an expert is denied, and all of the parts of Dr Golden's affidavit objected to by the ACCC were excluded, and she also made a point of saying that the council can't complain about excessive scrutiny of Dr Golden's affidavit when he had ample opportunity to do the same to the ACCC witnesses. So then Dr Golden appeared via video link and he was told immediately by lovely Miss Higgins that most of his testimony has been excluded and that he would be restricted, his evidence would be restricted to just answering the questions that she presented to him. She was a sweet, sweet lady until you hear her cross-examining someone. It was just, it was just astounding. And he was very unhappy about it. Um, uh, so she, and she, she accused him of um, cherry-picking and by omitting c- conclusions from his references that contradicted his evidence. And um, so then he was only, I think, questioned for about 10 minutes, and that was it, whereas the other, other expert witnesses were you know, up for an hour or two. Now, Judge Perry then asked on what basis Dr Donoghue was an expert witness. Given that part of his affidavit was a CV dated 2003. (laughs) So, most of his affidavit was also excluded as the evidence because it consisted of more than 50 links with no context. You know, what we would call gish gallop. He was, a me- he was meant to appear as a witness, but um, Mr White decided uh, it was probably best if he didn't actually appear in the court after, <laughs> after he saw um, how she handled Dr Golden. And Dr Schultz's um, evidence by affidavit was completely excluded on the basis that it was irrelevant. <laughs> So we move on to over a year later and on the 22nd of December 2014 I was in court with Richard Saunders, 
Peter bowed it to knee and Bryce. And as, as the judge was reading out the findings, we weren't sure whether she was just actually reading out the charges um, because it was the findings were that she was <coughs> guilty of all of them. So the court declared that the first respondent and the second respondent, so the first respondent is homeopathy plus, the second is Fran Sheffield, have in trade and commerce engaged in conduct that was misleading and deceptive or was likely to mislead and deceive in contravention of Section 18 of the Australian Consumer Law. There is no reasonable basis in the sense of an adequate foundation in medical science to enable the first respondent and the second respondent to state that homeopathic treatments are safe and effective as an alternative to the vaccine for the prevention of whooping cough. Now, some of the key findings in that judgment were that the ACCC expert witnesses gave evidence that the vaccine is effective in protecting against the contraction of pertussis. There was no credible evidence put forward by homeopathy plus and much of the material on which homeopathy plus relied wasn't credible um, some of her sources included um, Greg Beatty and Meryl Dory and that homeop- homeopathy plus was selective in the articles choosing only those parts that support her existing views or as we know it cherry picking now they had a it's not over yet. They had a hearing in April this year and the ACCC asked for $62,500 penalty against Homeopathy Plus and 12500 for Fran Sheffield. Homeopathy Plus claimed financial difficulty and said that a financial penalty would be financially ruinous for them and that she has ill health. Now, the the judge was really disdainful of the financial claims because of a lack of evidence to support it, um, being a court and all. Um, She actually said, you haven't even produced a bank statement. And she made it very clear that she wanted to know about the income of Homeopathy Plus. All that Fran had put up was a statement of assets and liabilities and nothing about, you know, the everyday goings on. And she also commented that Fran didn't seem to appreciate the seriousness of the proceedings, all the findings, Um, and she based that, I think, on the paltry sort of evidence they provided for the financial situation. And another interesting thing was... um, Friends, barristers said that they shouldn't be financial, they shouldn't be penalised at all because it's just a mum and dad corner shop uh, operation. And the judge said to him, with 12,000 online subscribers. <laughs> now, the maximum penalty for false or misleading, blah, 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 is 1.1 million for corporations, okay, um, and $220,000 for individuals. Now, this slide. I would, would normally have left, uh, left out for this one, but after the penalties hearing, the judge decided to give Fran and Homeopathy Plus a bit more chance and a bit more time and a chance to improve their evidence. So she said that the applicant, ACCC, has leave to file, serve any supplementary submissions by the 25th of May, and Fran had leave to file and serve any supplementary submissions by the 5th of June. So she gave her a month and a half or so to to submit something else. So what did Fran do? Nothing. In her judgment, the judge stated that there is clearly income being earned by Mrs Sheffield and her company, Homeopathy Plus, which she has chosen not to disclose. She made mention of the fact that they had two full-time employees, which are her two adult children and two part-time employees, as well as Fran. So there must be income. So she's produced no evidence for that. And she also said, I can give little weight to the impact that any pecuniary penalty might have on her financial situation 
Given the failure by Homeopathy Plus to provide any real disclosure of its financial circumstances. So Judgment Day last Tuesday, the, the headlines are that the three offending articles are to be permanently removed from the Homeopathy Plus website and that Homeopathy Plus be restrained from promoting or supplying homeopathic, homeopathic vaccines as an alternative to pertussis vaccine for five years. So she can't talk about it and she can't sell it. Now, the financial penalties. So instead of the $75,000 that the ACCC was happy to um, take, the judge awarded a $115,000 penalty to Homeopathy Homeopathy Plus to be paid in 30 days and a $23,000 penalty to Fran Sheffield to be paid in 90 days. And the costs were awarded to the ACCC. Now, this is all because she refused to disclose her financial income. So anyway, she hasn't... uh, I had a look on her website yesterday, so she's taken all references to homeoprophylaxis off her website except for animals. Okay. Now, much was made of Fran's ill health at the penalties hearing um, and, uh, you know, a lot of people have joked about that because she reckons homeopathy can cure so many things. These are the things that Fran has claimed can be cured by homeopathy. HIV, Ebola cholera, typhoid, malaria, pertussis, radiation sickness, irritable bowel syndrome, mange in dogs, middle ear infection, osteomyelitis, urinary tract infection, sinusitis, lipoma in birds, autism and fractures. So I guess all that leaves is cancer. (laughs) Oh, and the latest one she's got on there is that uh, homeopathy plus um, cures hangovers too. (laughs) <laughs> well, yeah, we know most, most, most hangovers are caused by dehydration. Now the question is, what's going to happen now? Because I don't think she's going to pay. <laughs> well, we've got to move on now, guys, to the next one. So thank you very much to Maureen again, guys. Thank you. Hold on, thank you. Are you tired of waiting for the end of the world? Is the grey nano goo coming for you? Or are you just annoyed by those hordes of undead? Or the colour of the moon? Or even swarms of assorted biblical insects? Could that silly movie 2012 actually have any basis in reality? Or will the machines rule us all? For these questions, a fun weekend and more, come to the New Zealand Skeptic Society 2015 Annual Conference, Christchurch, 20th to 22nd November. Evidence shows that we even have some real scientists speaking on fantastic topics. When the echoing hoofbeats of the four gender-neutral equestrians of the apocalypse ring out across the world, where will you be? Christchurch, New Zealand, 20th to 22nd November. Apocalypse how? After all, we're the go-to place for natural disasters. For further details, visit conference.skeptics.nz. New Zealand Skeptic Society is a charitable organisation that exists to promote critical thinking. The devil is not real. Look, I'm with someone now that I've wanted to interview for a long time. Joe Nickel, how are you? I'm good, thanks. Well, yeah, well what do you think of the, the people who think that uh, some of these mass shootings never happened? I find that a little bit unusual. I can understand people having anomalies because uh, um, uh, when I saw the, uh, the, uh, the, the, the coroner at the Sandy Hook uh, shooting, he was certainly acting very strange for a professional. But then again, I've never had to do a mass autopsy on a bunch of children, so I don't know, I don't know what would be going through his head, you know? 
Well, exactly. And, and after all, real detectives and coroners and so forth are human beings, and some of them are odd, have odd personalities mm. and so forth, and, and they may look a little odd. And, and they're odd, fluky circumstances. I've worked real homicide cases with police, and odd things happen. Just, Bullets will sometimes do a, a funny thing, when, and you know that they did, but, but if, you were try, if there was somebody who wanted to make a conspiracy out of it, you'd think, well, it does seem like a un- very rare, unusual thing for a bullet to do. Is there a whole surreal air that surrounds an investigation of, of, of a murder, or is it more like a matter of fact go through a flowchart? Kind of depends on whether the murder is is um, again not to use the word prosaic, but whether it's just another murder, uh, and you can without a lot of spotlights being shined on you, without a lot of crazy people coming at you, without a lot of tabloids wanting a story, no matter how fake it is, uh, you can pretty much go at it in a routine and professional way. But once you have a high-profile case, once you have the president of the United States has been shot or terrorists have driven, flown planes right into the, the uh, Trade Center buildings, uh, somehow these, these conspiracy theorists uh, come out of the woodwork. It's scary. They, they appear to... Um, have some sort of aberrant um, thinking process because the kind of evidence that you and I would regard as pretty much we saw that and it's pretty clear and pretty straightforward and what they're trying to sell you is from the Wizard of Oz uh, you know devil version um, it, you just you just have to marvel at how they think and how they they seem to start with an answer that they want, that this is some kind of vast conspiracy and engage in what's called confirmation bias. Um, the same way sort of the Shroud of Turin do, but of course they're, they're greatly sensible in comparison to the conspiracy theorists. But the, the Shroud people will say, you know, this is the Shroud of our Lord. And you can just look at it and see what a marvel it is. Well, okay, but then, the, the, you know, I come in and I say, well... You know, this shows that the body of Jesus was wrapped with a cloth under and over the top of the head and lying across the front. And let me tell you, the Jewish mission makes clear that's not how the Jews wrap their bodies. The Gospel of John says specifically it was the manner of the Jews. And he describes multiple cloths, a separate face cloth, and so forth. So they, they, they rationalize that. Yes, but the Gospels could be, you know, wrong or there could have been special circumstances. And you think, well, there's, there's no history for the shroud for 1,300 years. Where was it? Well, we believe it might have been hidden away and blah, 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 and a lot of pseudo history that would make even von Daniken a skeptic. And then, you know, that, well, what about the forger's confession? Oh, we think that was trumped up. That, that bishop was jealous. Well, he was a bishop, and he wrote to the pope, and he seemed to know whereof he spoke. And he said there were lots of other people who could confirm what he said at the time. And uh, really? And then you think, well, okay. And then the Macron Laboratory found tempera paint all over the shroud? Oh, yeah, well, we think that uh, that could have been added on later. Somebody was touching it up and so forth. And then finally the carbon dating, which carbon dates to the time of the forger's confession, and they think, well, maybe Christ's uh, resurrection, you know, the burst of radiant energy at the moment of resurrection, altered the carbon dating. Or maybe the fire of 1532 uh, somehow altered the carbon with, and so forth. He said, well, you don't know much about carbon dating because those things well, you know, the, the, the process uh, uh, you know, purifies the sample so those wouldn't be contaminants. But it's, it's, you can see that they have started with an answer. And no matter what you find or say, um, the, the, uh, they, they have some rationalization. But notice that their rationalizations have nothing to do with each other. Each rationalization is a special one to defend a particular point. But then turn that around and look at what the skeptic's position is. Well, it doesn't match Jewish burial practices because it was made in the middle of the 14th century in Europe. It's, it looks too good to be true and looks too picture-like because an artist made it. An artist confessed. We have a bishop's report that the artist confessed. The blood is still bright red because it's tempera paint. We found tempera paint. The radiocarbon dating dates it to the time of the forger's confession, and I could go on and on. Mm. So you see that, that what the skeptic has is 
interlock. I'm locking my fingers together here to show how this works. But the, the evidence is interlocking and solid and corroborative as opposed to they, they start with a belief in their heart and they look for a, an excuse or a rationalization for every point that's made. They don't, have, they don't have any corroborative evidence or any solid evidence. They have maybe this, could be that, we think this. And a lot of, of even that is pseudoscience, and they've been caught at some of this. And even the church itself has disclaimed now some of the uh, more recent excesses with uh, some of the claims that's been made. The, the church is... People think the, sh- the shroud is uh, that the Catholic Church is trying to, you know, put out something. Well, actually, it was the it was the Archbishop of Turin and his crowd that had the shroud and were trying to promote it. When the Vatican got control of the shroud after King Umberto, the exiled king of Italy, died, um, and he he technically owned the shroud. The archbishop kind of had a little game that they played about about this. But once Umberto died and bequeathed it to the Vatican, look what happened. The Vatican came forward with very good tests. Very, They didn't just pick uh, shroud loyalists to do the test. They got real scientists from the real big laboratories and put it in their, put it in the British Museum's hands to authenticate and and to coordinate this. Perfect. What's what's the objection to that? And the, and the results were devastating. It, it appeared to be fake. And and the Vatican has accepted that. As far as anyone, they've never said we we disagree or this is a travesty or no. They just accept it. And look at the new Pope. Uh, Francis, who, yes, I disagree with him on some things, but he's he's done some very good things and said some very good things. Look what he said about the Shroud of Turin. He said he referred to it as kind of, you know, wonderful or whatever adjective he used, icon. Well, wait a minute, uh, because if it's an icon, that means it's a work of art. Mm-hmm. Shouldn't he have, if he believed the Shroud was genuine, he should have called it a relic. And I'll leave you with this question. Um, does, does the Pope know the difference between a relic and an icon? And let me answer that question with another question. Is the Pope Catholic? <laughs> They're all about icons. He knows exactly the difference okay. between a relic and an icon. To be a world expert on this. A question that uh, we can't attribute this quote to you, but I mentioned it to you the other night, is before you investigate an unusual event, make sure the unusual event actually happened. Yes, that's an excellent rule, and, and uh, all of us who've done much investigation learn the truth of that pretty soon, either either. Uh, fortunately, before we make a big mistake or, or we make a mistake, say, ah, yes, there's the rule. Uh, the uh, Canadian psychologist James Alcock named that principle after Ray Hyman, who I don't know if Ray originated it, it it's, but he may have. And, and he refers to it as Hyman's categorical imperative. And, and that is, as you said, uh, before you try to explain something, make sure it really happened. And then there are some corollaries to that, sort of make sure it really happened in this particular way that's being said. Maybe it happened, maybe there was an incident, but maybe it happened a little differently. Or uh, have you checked out all the details and so forth? I mean, there are some corollaries that you could put into that, but it's a, but it's a wonderful principle because uh, we, we see all the time, um, and I could give you cases of mine where, um, like the case of the disappearance of Oliver Lurch, uh, also known as Oliver Larch, and there are different versions of the story, but uh, he uh, disappeared walking in the snow one night to go to the well to get some water and so forth, and the family heard him, and they were crying for help, and they rush outside, and they find his footsteps going halfway to the well in the snow, and Oliver was never seen again, and there was just his footsteps ended in the snow and so forth. Well, I've seen people try to explain how that. I tried to explain how. Well, maybe he got up on the fence and was walking on the fence, and then he slipped off, fell in the well, and and uh, we, we never saw him again. But at the same time I was doing that, I was following the categorical imperative, and I had hired a, a researcher in the area of South Bend, Indiana, to research that that family there was no such family ever existed no such farm no such person ever 
or, or even the family name. Turns out that that story was plagiarized from an Ambrose Bierce short story. Yeah. So, uh, but but what I did was to try both. Let's assume it did happen. Could we possibly explain it? And I came up with a okay, a little bit of a far fetched explanation, but possible. And at the same time, uh, let's see if it happened. And and I'm working both together, uh, as as I often do. And uh, now, what do you want to take a crack at? Is there a paranormal mystery or something that's come up recently, or you've always wanted to get to that you haven't been able to? I don't telegraph that to the world. I've had some unfortunate experiences, actually, because I'm, you know, kind of the guy that you want to, if you're trying to out, out you make a name for yourself, you might want to uh, step on my shoulders and leave me in the mud as you leap up. Um, so I've, I've had... I've had unfortunate situations where I talked to some students and they they went uh, and told the people not not meaning maliciousness oh yeah, just it just, just uh, mm-hmm. told people I was working on this and what my theories were and all that it was not helpful. Mm-hmm. Well, uh, so, we, we have, we've had some great uh, mass UFO sightings here in Australia and Melbourne in the '60s and that sort of thing. How do you go when you have multiple eyewitnesses of something unusual? How do you how do you pass that? Well, people. People may very well see the same thing. And to go back to my uh, Flatwoods monster case, uh, where where some you know some kids uh, on a ball field saw a flying saucer, and they uh, it was getting dark, and they ran up into the woods, and and pretty soon they saw a monster that now appears to have been a barn owl. Well, uh, what about the UFO? Multiple witnesses, right? Mm. Okay, and let's not dismiss it because it was little boys they, they were they were old enough to know they saw something and they, they they did see something but we know what they saw now they saw a meteor how do we know because it was reported over three states and we had astronomers who saw it so end of end of discussion on that so yes people can see something they can all think oh well, that's a mysterious thing i've never seen anything like it because none of them are experts in meteors. Uh, people can see even an ordinary airplane under unusual atmospheric conditions, and it can look quite mysterious. And they may see an upper atmospheric research balloon or um, space debris or a hoax balloon with candles. Uh, I've investigated so many different kinds of phenomena like that. So what, what it means when you have multiple witnesses is, yes, there probably was something in the sky. Yes, yes, and they, they, several people saw it. But uh, if one person is mistaken, why wouldn't the next one be mistaken? Were any of them experts in the aerial phenomenon? No, they never, almost never are. The people who see these things are just ordinary folk, and they don't know what they saw. Can I ask you about what your point is on the Travis Walton case? I've actually met him, and it seems like he seemed to experience something to me. How do you feel about that? I I think most of the alien abductees uh, have had experiences in which um, quite a number of them are fantasy-prone personalities. And this this comes out, if you looked at uh, Dr. Mack's book, John Mack's book, Abduction, um, and he has, a, he has 13 uh, abductees, a chapter on each, and you read that. Very soon you realize these are not average people. They're not you, me, your friends. These are different people, and they're unusual people. They have a highly uh, uh, developed uh, uh, ability to imagine things. They are... Um, um, have have vivid dreams. All of them were easily hypnotized by definition because that's how Mac judged them. You see, so right away these are these are different people, and so uh, I showed that uh, that there are a number of markers for what psychologists call fantasy prone personality, and and you can go through with the checklist and you can read his book and and just show that they're you know they're sincere and all that and they're sane and normal. There's nothing wrong with them, but they're what's called fantasy prone, a high propensity to to imagine and and to believe what they imagine. Travis Walton appears to be of a different sort. And Travis changed his story. And Travis told his mother, if if, uh, if you don't hear from me for a while, don't worry about me and so forth. There are all kinds of tips 
Uh, Philip Class, in one of his books, uh, dealt at length with the Travis Walton case and concluded it was probably a a hoax. That Travis, um, his friends may not have been in on it with him. They may have been. He may have thought, I can fool them. I'll go off. You wait here. And they saw some bright lights that he he arranged uh, some kind of display or something. Uh, The least likely explanation... The least likely explanation is that this was an extraterrestrial event of any kind. Uh, much more likely is that Travis Walton is a bit of a character, bit of a showman, bit of a, uh, as he's shown himself uh, subsequently, a guy looking for attention and and uh, milked this and made almost a little career of, of this tale and got a movie made and so forth. Okay. And as, as a regular detective, when unusual cases like this come to the regular police department, how are they treated? Because you've got murders and investigations going on all the time and suddenly something outside the experience comes here. How do the police department normally handle that? Police departments are not well equipped. They have no better uh, knowledge or, or ability to investigate a UFO than anybody Um, They have no notion what to do in a poltergeist case where objects are thrown around. A policeman going in and and pretty soon he's saying, I saw that object leap off the shelf and whatever. He didn't, but but he's not. People think a policeman's a trained observer. Well, he's an ordinary guy. He's just an ordinary guy with a gun. And, and uh, okay, he's got some sense and and, uh, may, may be a very wonderful person as police uh, at their best are. But uh, they're not trained in any way in any of these paranormal cases, and they may, in fact, be just as superstitious uh, as, or more so than the average public. I mean, I mean I've, seen, I've seen the police commanders who were um, from uh, kind of uh, fringe religious sects uh, and believed in the devil and so forth. And you think, well, okay, so is that guy a solid policeman or is he a bit of a wacko? Well, he's he's okay as a solid policeman when somebody pulls a gun or something. He may be a great, brave man. Somebody pulls a prank that looks like uh, some devil work, and he's caught right up in it. I mean, we see this all the time. Um, scientists, as well, aren't trained to to examine trickery. Scientists, if you think about it, depend on a world in which everybody's being honest. Mm. And so in science, uh, uh, you found something, here's a specimen, you didn't fake it, so now I can test your specimen and so forth. But if, but if somebody's a crook or somebody's a <laughs> deceiver, the scientist is, is completely bewildered because he's... He's, he's, he's had no way to protect for, for that. So that's kind of why our organization, Committee for Skeptical Inquiry and Skeptical Inquiry Magazine, and of course uh, Brisbane Skeptics, Australian Skeptics, and all the great skeptics groups around the world, what we do is we try to become informed, uh, use expertise, because some of us will be detectives, some will be forensic people, some will be physicists, some medical doctors, and so forth. So we can draw on, if, if I'm not a doctor, I know one. And we're all pretty much trained to use certain basic principles that, like burden of proof and Occam's razor and, and uh, so forth. So we function, I think, as a public service. The scientists don't want to fool with what they regard as nonsense, Bigfoot and so forth. Well, no, we're, we're happy to look at that area because somebody needs to. And the scientists shouldn't be deterred and, and bothered by silliness. We are willing to look at these fringe claims and can bring um, at it when we're at our best, and that means we're not dismissive and debunkers and so forth. When we're at our best, uh, we can often clarify these cases and uh, catch hoax. I've caught many, uh, many uh, tricksters, caught them red-handed. Uh, we can often maybe not absolutely prove something, but we can infer something from the evidence as we can infer that, say, the, the Nazca lines are ritual walking paths now. We have very good information to infer that. We don't have to depend on police. So I think what police, I would advise police, you know, to 
okay, maybe show up the first time when some disturbance, but once they find it's a little bit um, paranormalish or supernaturalish or whatever, uh, refer the people to a psychologist or or get to know their their local skeptics. Refer the case to them. Ask for their help. And whenever that's been done, um, I think uh, things are on a much better plane. And, Joe Nichol, what's the best one of your books that sums up many of the cases that you've looked at over the years? And what's the best website for you to have a look at? Well, m- my website is, is joenickel.com, and that you have to spell nickel, N-I-C-K-E-L-L. Um, and that has some of some of my work. It's It's hard to pick just one book because I... I, I've written maybe 40-some books, and maybe that's 38 too many, but it's hard to say just which ones. If you if you were interested in historical mysteries, you'd want my uh, unsolved history. If you were looking at religious miracles, you'd want my The Science of Miracles. If you were interested in ghosts, The Science of Ghosts, and so on. So how do you go when you sit down to watch the History Channel and ancient aliens are on? Because uh, it's like Von Danik and he's back. He's back. Make sure I've taken my blood pressure medicine. <laughs> Joe Nickel, this has been the highlight of my weekend, and it's great to know you're a bourbon drinker, man. Yes, and, and the author of a, of a book called The Kentucky Mint Julep, which, uh, it, you know, is a bourbon drink, and, and I, I claim some authority to being an expert. <laughs> and that, that, uh, that book has, has my title, Colonel. Joe Nickel. I am, an, I am a Kentucky colonel, oh, wow. as authentically so as Colonel Sanders. In other words, the governor, <laughs> the governor bestows the title colonel on you the same way the queen would make you a knight oh, and sir so-and-so. And, uh, Though, of course, I'm not suggesting in any way that, that the governor's uh, making you a colonel is anything, a fraction as prestigious oh, yeah. as the queen making uh, one a knight. And, uh, what, what's, your, what's your bourbon of choice? I mean, I don't do some buzz marketing here. Oh, but I don't, no, I don't. I don't do that, but I, I say that uh, you know find find a bourbon you like, and uh, then you know get some fresh mint and, and a little sugar and a little bit of water and muddle them together so that you make a mint syrup in the bottom of your your old fashioned glass, say or oh, whatever. Yeah, that, that's what you need. You need that wide base glass. Yeah, and and you make a little mint syrup, then you you. Fill the glass with crushed ice if you have it. If you don't, just use ice cubes. But it's crushed ice is clearly better, leaving the spoon in the glass while you do that. Then you pour two ounces, two ounces of bourbon. This is a strong drink. Mm. On top. Now you take the spoon and just gently stir. So you mix up the, the mint syrup in the bottom with the, with the bourbon. And then just carefully with, withdraw the spoon. You're almost ready. Now you put a sprig of fresh mint in from the top so that you can kind of sniff it as you sip. Mm. And be careful that you sip it because it will knock you for a loop if you yeah. gulp it, it down. Like it's not like a snap. You don't slam it down. You take your time with that. Is that it's a southern a thing? It, it is. It is. And in the old days, you know, the, 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 the Kentucky colonels uh, left over from the Civil War, you know. Would, and you uh, need a drink after that. Hell. That's right. That's right. And you'd, you'd have sort of down away from the plantation house, you'd have a little spring house where, where you could cold natural water would come out of the little spring house and the whole little house was kind of a little fridge you know so you could keep your bourbon in there uh, you could and, and, and in that wet ground around the spring house the mint would grow in the shade and the cool so, so you go down to the, the spring house and get some cold water and some fresh mint right right off the vine and and of course the bourbon, and and uh, they would take their visiting friends down there and sit in chairs and, cool. and sit around and drink drink this drink, because if you if you um, treat the mint julep uh, like a mixed drink and you can just gulp it down, a lot of mixer and very little alcohol, the the the, the julep is a powerful drink. I, I say two things about it. I remember once. Uh, at, a, at a party, uh, a, a person came up to me and said earnestly, please don't let Daddy have any more of those. <laughs> so that was, always remember that. 
It's a great quote. <laughs> it is a, is a great quote. And the other is, I'll have people who will say, well, I think you have to do the recipe a little differently. You know, some have this theory or that theory about, you know, how you use the mint leaves or what you put in and so forth. And I say, well, true. But after you've had a couple of them, it doesn't much matter what you do. That's true. Look, then, more information, evidence-based bourbon information can be found at joenickel.com. And thank you very much for having a chat with you. I've been wanting to have a chat for a long time, Joe. My pleasure. Thanks for asking such good questions. Coming up on Thursday, the 5th of November... That's only in a few days. Sydney, Skeptics in the Pub. The Crown Hotel, the corner of Elizabeth and Goulburn Streets in the city, kicking off around 6pm. And the talk this month, an overview of medical cannabis in Australia with Dr. Teresa Nicoletti. The New South Wales government has recently established the Centre for Medical Cannabis Research and Innovation. The centre will conduct clinical trials of the medical use of cannabis, not just for terminal cancer patients, but for other conditions such as epilepsy. This promises to be a very interesting talk indeed. The best thing to do is to uh, go to meetup.com, look for Australian Skeptics, follow the links and join in. Thank you for listening to The Skeptic Zone. I've come back up to the balcony now, looking out the thunder and lightning still going on. Wow. Even that, that one even scared a bird out of the tree. Coming up on next week's show, more reports from the National Convention with Maynard chatting to oh, one, of the, uh, one of the best people in skepticism, folks. Wow! Uh, her name's not wow. That's just the lightning I saw. Eugenie Scott. Eugenie Scott was in Brisbane for the blimey for the convention. So we will look forward to that interview. More from Maynard, of course, at the convention, chatting to various people. And uh, I hopefully, hopefully we'll have a report from Joe Alabaster or Heidi Robinson. Well, tune in next week and find out. But for now, for this week, this is Richard Saunders ducking for cover from Sydney, Australia. You've been listening to the Skeptic Zone podcast. Visit our website at www.skepticzone.tv for contacts, an archive of all episodes since 2008, and our online store. Please support the Skeptic Zone by following us on Twitter at Skeptic Zone, liking us on Facebook, and leaving a review on iTunes. You can also show your support by subscribing via PayPal for as little as 99 cents a week. The Skeptic Zone is an independent production. The views and opinions expressed on The Skeptic Zone are not necessarily those of Australian Skeptics Inc. or any other skeptical organisation. Grandma Saunders peanut butter cookies. What do you need? Half a cup of butter, half a cup of brown sugar, half a cup of granulated sugar, one egg, half a cup of peanut butter, I prefer crunchy, half a teaspoon of salt, half a teaspoon of baking soda, one cup of flour, and half a teaspoon of vanilla. The instructions say cream butter. Add sugars gradually, beating until creamy. Mix in an egg, peanut butter, salt, and baking soda. Blend in the flour slowly. Add vanilla and mix well. Roll into small balls and place on a greased cookie sheet. Press the balls flat with a fork, but make sure the fork is uh, dipped in flour first. Bake in a moderate oven, 350 degrees Fahrenheit, for 10 to 12 minutes. Yield? Four and a half to five dozen. And they are just delicious. Thanks, Mum, for making thousands of peanut butter cookies since the late 60s.